Good afternoon um, to all of our friends um, in Europe. Um, good morning um, to all of our friends um, in the United States. Um, and good afternoon or good night to everybody who joins us um, from Asia. Um, it's a particular pleasure welcoming you today um, to our online conference uh, dialogue um, on the EU, on the global state, state, changing relations with the US, China, and Russia. It's a particular pleasure um, that Espen Germany, um, my home institute, um, has been able to organize this event uh, together with um, Espen Central Europe, um, and um, I have to say, um, Milan, uh, thank you so much um, for initiating um, this debate and for getting us together, um, organizing this exchange on this really, really um, important uh, topic. What we oftentimes see is that we talk about the triangle relationship of the European Union with the United States um, and with China, but we often leave Russia out of the equation and so I'm really delighted that we don't do this today, um, but that we look at the quad, quadrangle, I guess it's called. <laughs> so taking, taking, making the triangle bigger and also taking Russia um, in, into the equation. And I'm really looking forward um, to hearing the perspectives on this also from Central Europe and Eastern Europe because I'm very sure that there might be some divergences, but might be also some commonalities. Um, and um, this is um, the time to also hand over to Milan Vagina. It's a particular pleasure. Thank you so much, Milan, um, for initiating our debate and for doing this together with Espen. Germany. And I should have said, I am Stormy Miltner. <laughs> I am the director um, of the Aspen Institute Germany, and I've been doing this since earlier this year. Um, and um, I always forget to introduce myself when I do the introductions. I shouldn't. Um, I, I should write that down for the next time. So Milan, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Tome. So thank you very much for the introduction, but also for the good cooperation between the Aspen Germany and Aspen Institute uh, uh, Central Europe. So welcome on behalf of the Aspen Institute Central Europe. I think, as was said, today's topic is quite important because the new developments uh, in relations to, towards the US, towards the China, towards the Russia, are there and I think it's also important to discuss it from the different perspective from the perspective of the Western Europe but the, also the Central Europe and sometimes is also the different perspective within the country. So I'm looking forward also for the for the discussion and please uh, let me also introduce our moderator. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our moderator of the debate today and it is Soraya Sarhandi Nelson. So Soraya is an American journalist who was the program director at KCRW at Berlin. And she spent 13 years in the national public radio as an international correspondent running uh, offices in Kabul, Cairo, and Berlin. She won many, many awards for her radio work, but she won also many awards for her uh, newspaper uh, uh, reporter work because uh, prior to the radio career, Soraya spent 20 years as a newspaper reporter and was a part of the team which uh, uh, won also the Pulitzer Prize. So Soraya, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for the moderation and the floor is yours now. Thank you so much, Milan and Stormy. We have four very distinguished panelists today who will tackle some tough questions about the EU on the global stage and its changing relations with the US, China, and Russia. It's no secret, really, that getting the 27 Bloc members to agree on foreign policy and economic issues is kind of like herding cats. Germany and its neighbors to the south and east often don't see eye to eye, as we saw last week when Angela Merkel put a proposed meeting with Vladimir Putin on the table. That makes today's discussion particularly interesting as we will hear not only German perspectives, but Visegrad four ones. And um, we're, I'm going to introduce our panel in alpha, I'm sorry, in alphabetical order. Caroline King is the Senior Director in Berlin for Government Relations at 
the German multinational software corporation, SAP SE. She established the corporation's first global public affairs program and is responsible for the firm's business development support in international markets via Berlin. She also started the German office of the World Child Childhood Foundation, which was created by Queen Sylvia of Sweden. Caroline has a PhD in government from Georgetown University and boasts an extensive international network of influencers in politics, public affairs, and corporate social responsibility. Welcome, Caroline. And uh, next we have Sergei Lagodinsky. He's a member of the European Parliament and is with the Greens Party. He serves on the body's Committee on Legal Affairs and is also a member of the Democracy, Rule of Law, and Fundamental Rights Monitoring Group. Sergey has a law degree from the University, I'm sorry, University of Göttingen and a PhD in law from Humboldt University of Berlin. Before being elected to the European Parliament in 2019, he had a variety of top positions. One was as program director at the Berlin Office of the American Jewish Committee and head of the EU and North America Department of the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin. He also, and I'm sorry, my, I've, <laughs> I, have to, I'm, I have not memorized everyone's background, so I actually have it on the screen ahead of me. Bear with me one moment. My screen just uh, flipped up here. Um, he, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm cutting it short. The last line was that you've also practiced international law in the German capital. So welcome, Sergey. And yeah, and make sure that you guys unmute yourselves or it's going to be a very quiet discussion. So um, you can go ahead and, and unmute yourselves now. Um, our next panelist is Tomas Petsicek, who until recently was the Foreign Affairs Minister for the Czech Republic. He's also a senior non-resident fellow at the Institute of International Relations in Prague. Before serving for three years as foreign affairs minister, Tomas was deputy minister in his country's foreign affairs and labor and social affairs ministry. He was also an advisor to a European parliament member. Tomas has a PhD in international relations from Charles University in Prague, and his professional interests include international political economy, new technologies and their impact on economic development, social resilience and global environmental policy, and climate diplomacy. Welcome, Tomas. For the for the debate. <laughs> Great. Our fourth panelist is Maton Ugroshti. He's director of the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade in Budapest. His research interests include covering transatlantic issues, energy security, and U.S. foreign policy in Central and Eastern Europe. Before joining the Institute in 2015, Marton worked as the editor-in-chief of Kaitkinto.hu, and I hope I pronounced that relatively correctly. Um, it's Hungary's only news portal dealing exclusively with international relations, where he was in charge of the EU and North America column. Marton graduated with a degree in political science from Utvosh Lorond University in Budapest. He is a part-time assistant lecturer at Corvinus University of Budapest and an alumnus of the Hungarian American Enterprise Scholarship Fund. Welcome, Marton. Thank you. Well, after those long but hopefully informative introductions, I will I just want to let you know that I am going to be moderating this discussion, which is being recorded. We'll be asking the panelists audience questions throughout the event. So please type your questions, if you have them as we go along, into the Q&A box on your screen, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Our first few questions deal with European relations with the United States. And Thomas, I'm going to start with you. There's been much rejoicing, rejoicing in a number of EU states, especially Germany, about President Joe Biden's overtures at the G7 and in Brussels, with all sides talking about improving relations and mutual respect while they dance around more sensitive topics like tariffs and Nord Stream 2. How do the Visegrad four countries see this thaw in transatlantic relations? Uh I wouldn't uh, start from like the Sugrat four perspective, but uh, I would start with uh, uh, calling on uh, uh, moderating uh, the expectations uh, uh, from the new administration. Uh, I believe there will be in certain areas uh, continuity uh, in American foreign policy, and uh, we will see it uh, in terms of uh, dominant focus on uh, in the Pacific uh, on uh, issues like China, uh, where there is bipartisan agreement and uh, it is a huge priority uh, for the new administration. On the other hand, uh, we will see certainly some improvement, especially when it comes to atmosphere uh, between uh, both partners, uh, uh, both sides of the Atlantic, uh, from uh, issues like climate change, uh, where we see that the uh, 
it is a high priority for Biden's administration. And uh, we finally feel in Europe that uh, we can do something together with the United States. From the B4 perspective, if I may add to uh, what I have said, I believe that uh, there has been, uh, to some extent, uh, a bit of concern if uh, Biden's administration will uh, refocus American uh, attention uh, to bigger uh, European countries, uh, France, Germany, uh, which had uh, a lot of conflicts or tensions uh, uh, with the United States uh, during the Trump's administration. Uh, and Trump's administration balanced by focusing more on countries in the Central and uh, Eastern Europe, uh, especially Poland. But uh, we uh, really felt uh, that the tension is there. At the beginning, uh, we, we were concerned uh, that uh, this might lead to lack of uh, attention of the uh, American administration to the region. It hasn't material so far. Uh, and I, I think it only proves that we can look for a mutual agreement uh, uh, as a European Union, you know, what to do with the United States. Martin, what about in Budapest, though? Is Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who, of course, has become somewhat of a pariah within the European Union, and he certainly was more of a fan of Donald Trump than Joe Biden, you know, how is the reaction there to what's happening with uh, Biden's detente, if you will, with the European Union? Well, first of all, it will be interesting to see that how this moment of goodwill will last, because I do not really see the structural problems uh, resolved. Of course, we have seen an, seen an agreement on uh, the Boeing Airbus dossier, which is great, but we might have some differences remaining on the regulation of big tech, on uh, European political integration in general, and also the unsaid competition, economic competition between the, the US and the European Union. And I think as the uh, US focus is moving to China, it will be a harder question for Europe in the future to decide between the political friendship of the United States and the money the EU can make in China. I just looked at the statistics uh, to prepare for this event and quite tellingly almost 50% of EU exports to China are coming from Germany. And Germany has a trade surplus vis-a-vis -vis China around 14 billion, dollars last, uh, billion euros last year. So I'm more than eager to see that uh, despite the niceties and the summit tree and uh, the welcome back feeling of President Biden in Europe, uh, what the companies will have to say about that and um, what the German economic interest will have to say about being caught up in a trade or other kind of war, uh, of course, a physical war between the US and China in the future. Well, we're definitely going to talk more about China because as you point out, that's a very interesting question for all concerned today and beyond today. Uh, but in the meantime, let me just ask Sergey about what happens to German-US relation if the Greens end up the senior or even junior coalition member in the next German government. Is it going to be business as usual, or are there some changes needed with the way the transatlantic relationship between Germany and the United States works? I think that uh, for now, the, the, the Greens are one of the most pro-transatlantic forces. If you look at other parties and compare it to them. Why? Because um, I think with the constellation that we have now, a, a, a constellation, as they say in German, uh, not the constellation, um, uh, the, the Biden administration is kind of the last hope uh, for democratic uh, alliance. Um, and um, this is an, uh, an, an easy and, and a comfortable partner on many issues. Uh, on issues like climate change, for example, uh, or combat, combating climate change, but also uh, far beyond, if we're talking about the confrontation between the, the kind of the new systemic confrontation that we're facing. So I think that uh, it would be a good uh, uh, basis for a fruitful cooperation and uh, the Green Party there is on the front of, uh, forefront. I um, uh, am a little bit, um, surprised on certain issues about the Biden administration. And I think that uh, the, the position on Nord Stream 2 is something that we uh, could address as kind of a surprising move. And I think an unnecessary move, to be honest, uh, on behalf of the administration. Um, that's something that uh, we would need to talk. This is kind of a reversal of roles, uh, uh, if, if you wish, if you're talking about the green uh, uh, position. 
and, and uh, also the situation and the proposals on uh, dealing with uh, Moscow and uh, this uh, very interesting combination, interesting, strate unusual strategic combination uh, between talks and co kill, calling someone a killer. Um, I think on, on issues like those, we will probably have to talk also in order to uh, um, keep our Eastern European partners also on board. Caroline, it's interesting that Sergey mentioned Nord Stream 2 and how the administration was acting. I'm wondering what the new administration is doing with the US and Europe, European tit for tat uh, tariffs that were sort of, a lot of them were imposed during the Trump time, but certainly that it extends before then the conflict over trade. Do you think that's gonna change? I mean, is there gonna be any softening or is, is that gonna continue to be an issue? It'll probably continue to be an issue, but of course, from the industry perspective, we, we hope for a, an improvement in relations that at least it's, it's a positive signal that dialogue is being revived across all of these difficult geographies. That's, that's already a, a good sign. Um, but from the IT world perspective, uh, our problem with what's happening internationally uh, in this uh, digital global digital market is, is older um, than even the, the Trump era. It, um, we see an increasing amount of digital protectionism and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of talk about digital sovereignty, self-reliance, resilience, right? Um, decoupling, um, decoupling maybe less so with regards to the IT sector in particular, but certainly we, we, we've been dealing with uh, an increasing amount of protectionism in the first and biggest and still worst case is Russia um, for the sector overall. So tariffs uh, and improved climate, yeah, but uh, still an underlying really surge in nationalist protectionist uh, activity around uh, developments in the global digital economy. And that's a big issue, of course, for all industries and, 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 and for trade overall, because that's where industry is headed, where growth, where growth is going to happen in the next decades and without cross-border cross data flows and without the solutions and harmonized regulations around cybersecurity and the like, we, we won't see that growth. That will just hinder innovation. So we're gonna talk a little bit more now about European relations with Russia, which are more contentious, obviously, than US European ones. Uh, so let me start with Sergey and ask, what concerns do you have about Russian interference in the 2021 Bundestag elections and the Kremlin's maligning of your party co-chair and chancellor candidate, Annalena Baerbock? The concerns are um, the same concerns as we've been having them for months regarding uh, intervention and interference in any uh, political elections in any country. Uh, I'm not sure how um, uh, you know how firm we are regarding the interventions into the uh, elections um, of uh, Mr. Trump. This is probably a question uh, towards our American friends and how far uh, those uh, accusations were or were not substantiated. But what we see is an intervention and interference, which may be um, not so much um, um, uh, covert, you know, it's, it's not hidden. Um, it, when, when you watch uh, uh, Russian speaking or non Russian speaking outlets like Rupley and, and other, uh, you will see a campaign uh, going on against uh, Greens uh, generally, but also Western liberal, uh, uh, any, any parties who, who uh, are representing Western liberal uh, uh, lines. So I do think, and we are, of course, concerned uh, regarding what is still to come, but it's uh, and now it's quite obvious as well that there is a campaign. Uh, being driven also from uh, Moscow, uh, which is targeting uh, people like Annalena Baerbock and others. Um, I, I still would like to see more uh, evidence in terms of, uh, um, as I said, the covert um, uh, um, attacks. But uh, of course, what we are seeing is, is clear. Uh, the Green Party is not, it's probably the least um, desirable outcome uh, uh, from the point of Moscow. and. Uh, thus, there is a campaign going on. This past week, we saw some serious disagreements in Brussels over whether or not there should be a summit with Vladimir Putin to follow up on the one that Biden had with the Russian leader. A German-French proposal to that effect was shot down, and pretty harshly. Caroline, is Germany soft on Russia? And if so, why? Germany has 
I guess, of, of, um, among the Western uh, European EU members, the longest standing business and political and cultural exchanges over the uh, various organizations and forums. So there's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of interdependency economically. Is that soft? It's a, it was a growth market um, for many German companies for many years throughout the 90s. For SAP, it was the number five, number five market for, for many years. So there was a lot of you know, enthusiasm and support for what was seen as a uh, positive, liberal, democratic growth in the country. And uh, probably what you're seeing is, is still uh, hope and expectation that something uh, can be done at various levels within the Russian administration, but also within the Russian society and within the market to steer uh, those relations back on a more uh, positive course. Just a quick follow up. How uh, do any of you think actually that Germany's need for Nord Stream 2 is affecting the German approach to Putin? And I don't know if any, I can't see hands raised. So just shout out if you're, if you want to answer that question. Is that Sergey waving? I don't know. <laughs> I think Thomas first, Thomas. Thomas, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm having a hard time here with the technology, forgive me. So go <laughs> ahead, uh, Thomas, you first. Uh, it is always difficult to comment on something when uh, you are not an insider. Uh, however, uh, I would follow on uh, what uh, Caroline has said. Uh, I would see a uh, much broader picture, uh, especially when it comes to economic uh, uh, relations uh, between uh, Germany and Russia. And uh, Nord Stream uh, 2 is uh, probably the most controversial project, uh, but I wouldn't say that uh, it is a project that uh, has uh, brought the German politics uh, towards Russia to some level, uh, to some different uh, qualitative level uh, than it used to be before. Uh, I, <clears throat> I believe it is not uh, about uh, such a big uh, dependence uh, of Germany uh, on Nord Stream 2 uh, or Nord Stream 2 uh, that would uh, transform the German foreign policy. Well, let me ask you, or I'm sorry, Sergey, you wanted to say, add something to that? Yeah, just, just very briefly, I think that the relationship is the other way around. There is no objective necessity for Nord Stream 2, uh, but there is a, a kind of a sense of obligation, which arises from what Caroline described, but also from kind of this inherent um, wish um, for uh, rapprochement or for dialogue uh, uh, with the Russian government and everything else follows from that. So I would say sticking to Nord Stream 2 is, based, is, is more based on kind of this obligation. Uh, um, I'm trying to explain the, go the governmental thinking or the, the thinking of most of the political parties, kind of this, this, this thinking that, okay, we owe this uh, to finish this, to be a reliable partner. This is not a political project and so on and so forth. Everything else kind of results from that. Thomas, I just wanted to follow up with, uh, with you a little bit about this Russian relationship, because certainly the Czech Republic is at a low point in its relationship with the Kremlin following the Czech condemnation this, uh, of Russia this past spring in the 2014 Varbiet Tice, and I hope I pronounced that close enough, uh, terror attack. What stance do you think the EU should take in its approach to Putin? Uh. I would like to stress that uh, we should first clarify what are our expectations as European Union from Russia. Uh, I have seen many debates and I have uh, been part of many debates and uh, there are still uh, huge differences uh, uh, what uh, individual countries expect uh, from Russia. Uh, we are talking a lot about uh, now Germany, uh, but uh, if I take it from the east to the uh, southeast, uh, to Southwest, you have very different ideas what Russia means uh, in terms of security, in terms of uh, economic uh, potential, and in terms of a uh, broader uh, foreign policy agenda. Uh, for countries like Greece or Cyprus, it is probably in interesting from the uh, perspective of uh, Syria, Middle East, and uh, Russian uh, activism in the region from the uh, perspective of Spain. Uh, the issues are very different. So uh, I would uh, start by, by really working much harder on uh, what we can call strategic convergence 
within the European Union, so that we do understand Russia based on facts, and we can agree on this understanding uh, among ourselves. And uh, if you sorry, if you if you mention if you mentioned the uh, as you mentioned for example the <clears throat> most clash uh, at the European uh, Council European Summit about uh, meeting Putin, that's exactly the reason we don't know what the agenda should be about, and uh, as long as we don't have it uh, well defined, we are weaker uh, we are in a weaker uh, negotiating position vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. And we have seen it uh, during uh, Joseph Borrell's visit uh, to Moscow uh, this, uh, this winter. So do not underestimate Russia. You need to be prepared. You need internal cohesion on what uh, Russia means for Europe. And then we can start uh, uh, discussing uh, directly with Putin and uh, other representatives of uh, Russian Federation. Marton, what's the Hungarian view on this? I mean, certainly there are people in the West who accuse Viktor Orban of cozying up to Vladimir Putin, uh, and especially with Orban's uh, somewhat contentious relationship within the EU. I mean, what does he, what would he, or what does the Hungarian government see as the approach the EU should take towards Russia? Well, Hungary is always accused of being cozying up to whatever opponent the European Union might have. So it can be Russia, China, President Trump, whatever. <laughs> But the point is rather that uh, uh, I think the prime minister has been very clear on that because uh, he always claims that as, as far as it comes to security, we must be hawks. As uh, long as it comes to the economy, we must be doves. Um, so if you look at Hungary's track record on voting on the EU sanctions against Russia, always vote in that. If you look at the NATO cohesion of the Eastern flank, if you look at participation exercises, if you look at the Hungarian um, Air Force deploying to the Baltics to provide air cover for the Baltic states, you see that the track record is not that bad at all. But if you look at the economic interest, um, I think the same dilemma that Germany has, that you have to keep Russia at bay to some extent so it would comply with the international uh, standards and uh, be a somewhat responsible player of the international system, while at the same time you want to also do business with them, this is a very tough question. And um, I think the Hungarian position on that is that whatever the big member states can do, small member states can do as well even though uh, facts are showing that this is not always the case. Um, I just want to remind the audience, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A. Uh, and we are going to try to get to as many as we can. Um, so let me ask, go back to Caroline for a moment to ask her about whether she, uh, whether you think Putin is taking advantage of the divisions and of these divisions that we're hearing about, and if so, how? Well, I guess we are back in a, a geopolitical era, which a lot of people in Europe are probably not so well prepared for. Uh, there's still a strong belief in, in the good old fashioned regime theory and the, uh, the fact that institutional mechanisms would work. And uh, probably uh, we were caught off guard by uh, a, a round of enthusiasm, as I mentioned in my last comment in the 90s, that in uh, a round of decisions uh, um, from the EU side that were not so popular. So. Um, is he taking advantage of it? I think he knows how to play this uh, stage fairly well uh, internationally. Um, but I think that now uh, with the new American administration, uh, he must, uh, he will be meeting his match. And uh, we'll have to uh, reevaluate what the priorities are. Um, I think economically, uh, from what we see from the business side, uh, the country will also be facing tough decisions. Um, whether they can follow through on a nationalistic, self-reliant policy like the Chinese uh, want to do it or like the Americans are also increasingly talking about, it's, it's not so clear to me. Um, I think the, uh, Russia really needs the, uh, the support of international partners in the, in the business, on the business side and also uh, in terms of the innovation uh, exchange. So I, um, maybe he's... Uh, playing one side of the chessboard uh, tactically in a, in a smart way, but is it going to help in the big picture for the Russian economy and for uh, Russian international relations? I, I don't think so. 
Well, uh, we actually, Martin had mentioned a little bit about this earlier, and that is the European Union relation with China and Germany's relation with China. Um, that's certainly something that the United States is very concerned about, and Joe Biden has talked about quite a bit. Um, do you, Thomas, do you think that the Visegrad Four and Germany are more in agreement when it comes to China? And should they join with the US in a common approach to Beijing? I would say that, that there are still uh, slight differences uh, on uh, how we see China. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Germany and uh, on the other, uh, some countries in the region. I, I believe that uh, we have a uh, move on when it, from China over the past uh, three, four years uh, from uh, a point of like pinky, uh, rosy uh, perspective uh, to more realistic, uh, while some countries are still expecting that uh, China is playing uh, according to normal playbook. And uh, it means that they are still a little bit uh, too uh, naive about uh, China. On, and, uh, on I'm the, sorry, go ahead. West, <laughs> we have a bit of a delay. West, I, I have always argued that uh, uh, from a European perspective, uh, we shouldn't uh, pretend that uh, it is uh, as far to Washington as to Beijing. I believe that uh, we have to have in mind always that uh, uh, it is only through a stronger uh, relation that we can, uh, in this uh, renewed geopolitical uh, struggle, uh, Keep, uh, keep up uh, with uh, newly emerging powers. And it is not only, uh, only China. Uh, we are discussing a lot about China and Russia, but uh, we shouldn't forget India. Uh, we shouldn't forget other uh, quickly developing uh, countries that are, are emancipating themselves in the, uh, in the world uh, that has been constructed over the past uh, 70 years dominantly by US and Europe. Sergey, it was interesting because Martin talked about Germany being uh... In, uh, being dependent on China economically. I'm wondering if you see it the other way, I mean, if you agree, first of all, and if you think that um, Central European nations within the bloc are also too economically dependent on China. I think uh, uh, probably we all are, but uh, the, the, the fact is that China is also dependent on us. Uh, and, and I think it, it's fair to emphasize that. Um, the fact that uh, Eastern uh, European or Central European countries are dependent on China. Okay, yes, well, we are dependent on, on, on the resources from Russia as well. We are interdependent, this is the point. And uh, uh, what I've been missing is, is a little bit um, of um, maybe um, a self, um, there's kind of a self-secure understanding that this dependence is mutual and that not only looking for markets and looking for, um, uh, you know, what, what, how can we please the other sides? And this is not just, just China or Russia, it's, it's, it's general kind of attitude. We are looking for a more uh, strategic, autonomous, uh, or you want to, whatever you want to call it, strategic uh, um, sovereignty um, uh, from our side, and sovereignty means that you should evaluate uh, what kind of dependencies others have also from you, and how can you play this as a leverage, and I think we've been playing it uh, uh, too timidly, um, in a sense. Uh, so, so that, from that perspective, I think we should be, we should be viewing it. I, I think that it's not just uh, economic dependencies, and, and I'm, I'm coming back to, to the starting point, I think it's also kind of an ideological flirting uh, um, of uh, certain governments in Eastern Europe, Europe with this uh, idea of non-intervention, non-interference, uh, of, of a kind of a blind, um, value-blind foreign policy, uh, and, and, and that's, that's how it, it is being translated. You know, even, even if you're talking to, if you look at the Polish um, a government talking about China, you would all very often see this kind of color-blinded um, rhetoric uh, 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 color, color blind rhetoric uh, uh, coming from there. And uh, actually when they're talking about China, I have a feeling they're thinking about themselves 
uh, in the sense in, uh, in how they are being treated in the European Union. You know, don't intervene. This is ours. There is a cultural kind of relativism, uh, also in terms of certain understandings of traditionalism, et cetera, et cetera. And this is being projected also uh, on the situation with China. So we're back to this kind of ideological uh, uh, um, component that I think we shouldn't underestimate, uh, which also plays a role beyond the money uh, and the investments and the mutual uh, uh, dependencies flowing into, into it. And, and I mean, the, the uh, Fudan University uh, uh, example from, from Budapest is basically the, uh, this is the uh, symbolization of, of this relationship. Uh, Central European University should go and the Chinese university should come. Um, th that's, that's how ideologically you see the closeness of those, I would call it regimes by now, I'm sorry, Mar Martin, maybe, but uh, in that particular case, maybe we should already start talking about in that direction. Martin, I'm gonna let you respond to that, but I just wanna bring up something that Hungary Today noted in a recent article where it said, and I quote, Hungary seems to have become China's newest and best friend in Europe. Do you agree? I mean, do you think that this relationship is going to cause further division between Budapest and the and Brussels? Or do you think uh, what Sergei is saying is hypocritical because he comes from Germany, where in fact, uh, you know, Germans are are doing, you know, are, are having their own uh, relationships with China that might make people uncomfortable? Well, I would, def would not definitely call Sergei hypocritical on that, and not only because we're in the same panel, uh, but the point is that, um, you know, if I look at the numbers, the case is not so convincing. So if you look at Chinese investment in Europe, uh, Merrick's compiled great statistics on that, and uh, I ha should have it on my screen. So it seems like that Hungary has $2.7 billion of Chinese investment, Germany 24, France 15, UK not a new member state anymore, uh, 51, um, so Finland 13.3. Um, so when it comes to the numbers, it's a bit harder to argue that Hungary is the beachhead of Chinese expansion in Europe. If I look at trade, uh, basically the same applies, of course, that comes from the size of the Hungarian economy as well. Um, so that way, you know, it might be convenient for some of the EU member states that Hungary is vetoing some of the EU common communiques and, and positions on that. But I think they're secretly very grateful as well that they don't have to do that. Um, the ideological component there, I would very much argue with Sergey that uh, I do not see any kind of ideological similarity with China or Russia whatsoever. Yeah, traditions are important, that's true, but I think none of the governments which were mentioned are to import or, or you know, copy that kind of ideological scene that you can find in Russia or in China, for example. I mean, China, they don't even have elections. Okay, Russia has elections on paper, but how real they are, it's a different question. And you might think whatever you want about Hungary at the moment, but it looks like that we're going to be a very competitive election next year. So I wouldn't say that this is, you know, as sure as a Russian president, presidential election is most of the time. I, if I may react. I, Absolutely. I to say that, I mean, uh, thankfully we don't have uh, Uyghur camps uh, um, uh, yet uh, in Hungary, um, though other minorities are increasingly under pressure. Uh, um, no, I mean, I'm not saying, of course, that you have uh, similar regimes, but uh, what I'm saying is that there is a certain um, um, affinity uh, to, s to, to, to certain ways of talking about uh, value-driven uh, uh, foreign policies. Uh, and the uh, um, the meaning and the and the role of uh, kind of traditions uh, as justification uh, of relativism of a kind of a value and human rights relativism. This is something that you will hear on the on the international stage. This is something that you will hear at the UN, and this is something that we hear now within the European Union as well. Mostly coming from uh, Budapest, now also coming from Ljubljana. So th th there is this kind of a, a, a close um, proximity uh, in terms of the world outlook, uh, which I do think uh, does play a role. 
Caroline, let me take it to the economics for a minute, um, because I want to ask about the European Parliament decision to say no to the trade deal with China and to sort of put that on hold because of uh, the humanitarian concerns in uh, the Uyghur region, uh, China's crackdown on the Muslim Uyghur population. Um, what impact is this having on business? I mean, is there a nervousness that there, there isn't going to be a deal? And, and uh, I mean, I, how is the business community sort of reacting to the political uh, debate, if you will, about European-China relations. I think that this deal itself was not so critical for business, at least from the analysis that we were doing within our own sector. Um, generally speaking, it's more about the climate overall. Um, so there is some, again, some optimism with the new U.S. administration and the willingness to engage in, in dialogue. Uh, that's always a, a benefit for the business. Uh, uh, no matter uh, what else uh, happens. There is, and to pick up um, again what Sergei was talking about, there is an enormous interdependence, of course. China is a big market, um, not just for German economies, for, for all of the um, global exporters. Uh, that interdependence just kept growing under COVID despite trade wars and sanctions. That's um, not something that was uh, stopped. And there is an enormous thirst and an interest, of course, for the growth and the potential of the growth of the Chinese market uh, for, for many sectors. Um, I think other legislation coming out of China is of more concern. Uh, and as I mentioned at the outset, and older than the trade conflicts in the Trump, uh, Trump regime and based around uh, certain protectionist elements um, of, and it, at an enormous uh, interest in being self-reliant. Those are probably of more concern uh, to business internationally uh, and not just EU than the fate of this particular uh, agreement. I think that that shouldn't really be the, it's not the, uh, the ultimate uh, concern. Thomas, are you concerned at all that China might uh, sort of divide the Visegrad Four because there seem to be differing approaches to how this goes? Or do you think this is an area where it could actually strengthen um, V4 resolve? Uh, I wouldn't say that China uh, will play an important uh, uh, role as uh, an issue uh, in, uh, for the Visegrad Group. Uh, first of all, because uh, V4 is... Uh, dominated by uh, European agenda. Uh, the cooperation as it stands uh, today is more uh, oriented on uh, what is happening right now uh, in the Euro European Union or on uh, European Union external policies where we feel uh, we share uh, an accent or priority uh, the four of us, uh, be it Eastern partnership or enlargement. From China, I believe that uh, it won't be any big issue in the future. Um, there are clear differences, and uh, I believe that uh, uh, we should be increasingly aware that uh, it is very fragile uh, when it comes to China uh, um, having some closer bond or uh, some closer relationship. Uh, look, uh, if Budapest is currently considered to be uh, kind of like uh, the landing zone for uh, for Chinese uh, uh, political and economic uh, initiatives uh, uh, in in the region it used to be Prague, and uh, it is very very fragile and it can turn around uh, uh, in a couple of a uh, uh, couple of moments, and it's uh, very much dominated by political logic, not by uh, mutual uh, economic uh, um, benefits or reciprocity. Sergey, I'm going to circle back to the Biden administration for a moment and ask you whether he is having or his administration is having any impact on how European relations go forward with China. Do you see him have or his administration having some kind of effect? And if so, what will that be? I do think and uh, that, that this does have an impact uh, uh, from uh, on, on, on two levels. Number one, um, the way how, um, you know, you can talk um, rivalry and different uh, um, uh, tones, right? You can, you can use it uh, differently. And the way uh, uh, Trump 
uh, portrayed uh, this rivalry. Maybe it was objectively, you know, ha he had a point, but the way he was talking uh, about this, also with some racist undertones, etc., made it very difficult to follow uh, a suit and uh, uh, to support, um, also to explain it to the constituencies. Uh, now we have a different uh, uh, tone uh, in, in, in describing what is going on uh, uh, between the two countries or the two groups of countries. Um, and, and number two is, of course, there is a, um, uh, or at least in the, during the first uh, months, uh, there was this, at least in Germany, um, idea of uh, let's make um, uh, Biden, uh, you know, you know let's, let's make life uh, easier for Biden. Let's uh, join forces with Biden. Uh, now that that he's one of us, let's you know. I'm 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 putting it in a kind of a, in a uh, he's he's part of the democracies. Uh, now uh, let's not shy away uh, from uh, joining forces on various fronts of global responsibility and global fields. And and this is one of the main points for him. Uh, so there will be a lot of attempts also to join uh, the camp. And also it's, uh, it can be eye-opening as well, because uh, if you have someone you trust, and, and this is the case now, then of course, everything that, that they're saying, we have a, a, you know, more open eyes and open ears, and, and, and we're more receptive uh, to the arguments of the other side, because I have a feeling that the European Union and European countries on their own were not able to contextualize uh, the relationship with, with China in the global in geostrategic settings. And I agree with Caroline that we are still lacking a, a, a ability as a European Union and member states uh, to think geopolitics. We have, uh, you know, we have to relearn this and do it in, in a non-nationalistic and non, you know, <laughs> harmful, in a benevolent way. Um, so uh, that I, I do think that this uh, is increasingly on the agenda, increasingly on the radar. However, we must be careful and not uh, to kind of succumb and, 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 and to, to get sucked into this very China focused and exclusively China oriented policies because we do have to realize that we are in a neighborhood where Russia, Turkey and many other you Mediterranean, we have kind of regional uh, priorities that maybe are not shared by Washington. So we cannot follow suit on every step that Washington makes. And that was a, the, the, the mistake last week by Paris and, and Berlin with their proposal on dealing with Russia. Let's copy Biden. Let's do what Biden did and everything, everything will be fine. Well, this is not going to work because we have countries that are immediately affected by Russia and the way that, you know, some uh, 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 federal states in the United States are not. Uh, <laughs> and they have a different decision making power as well. So um, th th we will need to follow, we will need to join, but we cannot copy because our context is different and that we have to keep in mind. Marchand, you've been so patient. I know you wanted to add something, and I'm not sure it was to this question or the previous one, but please go ahead. It's as absolutely you correct. <laughs> Couldn't catch you, sorry. I'm sorry. But uh, surprisingly enough, I agree with you that we have to contextualize EU-China relations. And I think my problem here is that China is an existential threat to US hegemony. China is not an existential threat to European hegemony. First, because we do not have European hegemony over the world, and we do not see China as an existential threat in any of the theaters which are out there. And I think there's a clear expectation slash requirement from the United States side, so the Europeans would buy into this story that we have a huge clash between the Western civilization and China, and you must pick sides, otherwise you will be shot at from both directions. And if I look at the European context, if I look at the economic engagement Europe has with both of these great power centers, the, for me, it would be logical to, to try to stay in the middle, do business with both of them, do whatever it takes, but to be realistic and do not forget where we are. We do not have a territorial dispute with China as, as the European Union or as with EU member states. We might disagree on certain human rights issues and so on and so forth, but you know, as long as European companies start from start to disinvest from China, this is just talking. And um, even when uh, President Trump 
put it in a very harsh way that American companies must crack down on China and so on and so forth. Yeah, trade was declining. The American companies were pulling out and the European companies were filling the vacuum. So in this sense, I think Europe must be realistic when it comes to its own interests and Europe must be realistic in what are the outside requirements and what requirements we can support and what requirements we should reject. Final thought, I think President Trump was really useful for Europe as a wake up call. And if you look at when the real discussion started about strategic autonomy of the European Union, that was President Trump's time because for a long time, maybe after President Bush, but um, it was legitimate to say that the, the Americans don't know best and we should have our own ideas. And now President Biden came back and you know there's these structural differences over China, over Russia has, have remained, but still we see that we should agree with the Americans by default. But the Europeans have moved past that. We have started to think about on our, our own foreign policy. They started to think about strategic autonomy. So I do hope that uh, Europe will keep its own interests in mind and wouldn't buy into anything that comes out of Washington just because that's the American interest and not the European interest. I think we have a question from the audience. Katarina, do you mind reading it if you have it in front of you? Of course I will. Uh, talking actually about the own interests, uh, benefits and requirements about which uh, EU should be realistic. We have a question about the uh, 17 plus one initiative about between China and Central and Eastern European countries. And the question was that uh, Lithuania actually recently announced that it's leaving the 17 plus one network. Uh, so is that actually a first sign of exit uh, of other countries? Uh, should be expected that the Baltic uh, states, Poland or Czech Republic will follow? Who would like to answer that? If I may, I would uh, say that uh, it is not an end to uh, 16 plus uh, one uh, now, uh, but it is increasingly clear that uh, the period of uh, love affair uh, with this platform uh, is, uh, is over. Uh, first, uh, uh, almost all countries, especially EU member states, realized it is a lot about talk. Uh, a little bit about uh, reality and uh, and uh, real uh, real co cooperation. So it is a, a political vehicle uh, for China rather uh, than platform for uh, mutual beneficial cooperation. And uh, increasingly, countries are aware that it is uh, this coming with a with a price tag. This is not for free, and uh, uh, you have to be aware of it, that that. All the promises to make them materialize usually leads uh, to political vulnerability towards China. And uh, I would even say encroachment on uh, your sovereign, sovereign opinion to uh, behave uh, in an international uh, environment uh, on uh, international fora. Because uh, uh, as long as uh, China uh, feels that the uh, uh, you are in, a, in a, um, their system of partnerships, you should behave according to that, meaning that uh, you don't criticize too loud, for example. Yeah, indeed. Um, we're going to shift gears a bit and talk about the transatlantic agenda for global change. And I'm going to start with Caroline. She touched on this briefly about technology and digital questions. So I'm wondering where you see or where the business communities are on the transatlantic agenda for global change. I mean, do you think that they're moving ahead with this a little bit faster in some ways than uh, the governments are? I hope so. We certainly have a plethora of new initiatives uh, that are coming to life again. And uh, for me, having been through TTIP and uh, the TABD, the good old transatlantic business dialogue of many years ago, um, I, it, I'm, I welcome uh, this uh, new effort both bilaterally, the German uh, Industry Association, the BRT, and also at the European level. Um, there, I, as I understand, there'll be at least a, a tech trade council and, and maybe also a new green alliance. So I think that's uh, good news. There are a lot of open-ended issues to resolve. Um, there's a lot of work to be done on a joint sustainability uh, agenda, also in our uh, IT sector in terms of cybersecurity, IA, AI um, principles, um, replacing the 
the privacy shield uh, to, you know, to get cross-border data flows um, up and running again in, in a secure, uh, harmonized framework. So there's lots of work to be done, um, and that's just good news uh, to see a reinvigor reinvigorated interest. I just, um, I think it's a, one of the ironies of our recent history that it's business that's really pushing this multilateral agenda um, and, and maybe not so much the, the states anymore. It used to be the other way around. <laughs> but clearly, uh, business has a lot to gain, uh, especially, as I say, in our growth sector, in this growth economy, which is uh, really definitive for, for the global economy without those harmonized uh, standards and without that um, level playing field, it, it, that growth and innovation is just not going to be possible. So we're, we, uh, I think business, uh, generally speaking, welcomes it, of course. Sergey, would you say that the European Union and especially the V4 in Germany um, are more united uh, in, on, I'm sorry, more united on the transatlantic agenda for global change than perhaps on some of the previous issues we talked about, like Russia and China? Well, it depends on, <clears throat> on, on what aspects of uh, global change you're talking about, but I do think that uh, we as the European Union are united on, um, on, on, on the European vision or European member states vision of, of what it means to have, you know, a Paris climate and how to achieve or not achieve, I would say critically, uh, the Paris uh, climate goals, at least there, I think that the Commission um, is holding everyone together. I think that the Commission generally, uh, if we're talking about von der Leyen, um, even, even though she calls uh, herself and, and, and the Commission, the geopolitical Commission, it's more kind of a, a Commission which is, how would I say, surfing compromises and, and trying to rather you know, create compromises uh, rather than uh, lead by you know, ideas and vision. Um, and from that perspective, I think they take everyone on board on issues like those. The interesting point would be on issues that are uh, maybe also uh, issues of heated debate within, within the European Union, like, for example, if uh, Biden is serious on the democracy agenda, global democracy agenda, and maybe, uh, um, I, I haven't heard for a long time, but having a conference of um, uh, democracies uh, at some or alliance of democracies, would uh, um, would Hungary be invited? Would Poland be invited? And 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 who would not be invited? And why? Um, this would be, for example, one point where we would have some issues uh, uh, to to clarify. But other than that, yes, technology is of course an issue which uh, is interested for everyone. I think we need more invest investment into technology and more green investments as well. Uh, there we will see how the uh, um, resilience package now, the recovery package will look like in, in individual member states. And there it will be up to the commission uh, to make sure that those investments, huge investment that we're having are done in an innovative way so that we can profit uh, from innovation in and investment in innovation and in innovative technologies because one thing i think is important to say we can talk about a, a transatlantic kind of standard setting agenda only if we create technology uh, and have a homegrown technology in europe like sap and, and others because uh, this is not um, uh, the issue of, uh, um, of of you know the the e privacy that we had you know where you could uh, legislate and Facebook and all other platforms followed suit because they need us as a market. Well, if we're talking about artificial intelligence and we want to set standards, we can only set standards if we produce actually, and if, if we are an important producer, global producer of artificial intelligence, or the same with data clouds, um, etc. And the data market, I'm now you know legislating data governance app. That's good, but I mean. What are we regulating if we don't have enough uh, players that would be of global relevance? Then it doesn't matter. We're regulating ourselves. Everyone else is going to move on. So from that perspective, I think we're all on the same page. I think most countries understand. But it will be up to each individual country to invest more in their national plans and recovery plans, to invest more in digitalization and more into green technologies, 
in order to set standards and to be relevant globally and not to invest in kind of the old industrialized ag agricultural uh, uh, schemes just to please, you know, to make everyone happy and to keep everything as it is. We need to change the set, the mindset towards change and transformation. And, and this will be up to individual states. Tomas, do you agree or what for you is sort of the priority on the uh, global change agenda as you see it? I, I agree that uh, well, the top priority for us should be uh, the issue of climate change. Yeah, it is an exist existential issue and uh, it will uh, uh, translate into changing economic structures uh, into the way uh, our society are, uh, are living. So it, this is a very fundamental uh, issue uh, and uh, we need to be very cautious uh, about it and uh, give it a, a right priority. However, I would also stress that uh, we have uh, a long-term problem of uh, ineffective uh, uh, international system of international organizations. Uh, starting from uh, WTO, uh, we have seen during the pandemic uh, WHO um, not working properly. Uh, UN system, uh, security organizations like uh, OEC in Europe uh, and many others. So uh, I believe that uh, we have uh, a lot of work uh, if uh, there will be a new impetus for um, cooperation with, uh, uh, with the United States uh, in engaging other uh, partners uh, in reforming uh, the system of international organizations and providing uh, more serious grounds uh, for a global governance system. Uh, at the moment, it has fragmented. Uh, it has been uh, um, more or less weakened by uh, power competition uh, in the world. And uh, um, also we have lost a, a bit of universality uh, in it because uh, for many decades, uh, we believe that there are universal norms that apply to everybody in the world. Now it seems that uh, we are living in a, in a bubble, bubbled, uh, bubbled world, uh, that uh, you have a bubble of your own norms or uh, your understanding uh, what uh, the norms mean, uh, and uh, you don't want others uh, to get into your bubble. Uh, something like uh, on social media, um, which, uh, meaning it is politics, uh, global politics, it is uh, rather dangerous. And last but not least, I would like to mention uh, the issue of uh, arms control. Uh, we have uh, seen uh, fragmentation of the, of the uh, system that has provided uh, stability and predictability over the past, uh, I would say four decades, uh, but it's almost uh, five decades since the uh, uh, 1970s when uh, during the Cold War, US and uh, Soviet Union were able to start talking about uh, uh, control over uh, nuclear uh, arsenal and other uh, arms uh, categories. Uh, which provide, provided uh, predictability in rather difficult uh, uh, circumstances. We don't have it any, any longer. We have only uh, a new start uh, as a uh, last piece of, uh, of uh, structure uh, that uh, we should protect uh, and uh, build on it and engage others. So uh, arms control, uh, non-proliferation regimes, this is uh, a huge priority as well. Martin, what's a priority for the Hungarians when it comes to global uh, change? I think, first of all, climate change is an issue and surprising it might be um, for the Hungarian government, but they want to ensure that power generation will be carbon neutral as soon as possible. Solar nuclear, basically, that's the solution for that. Of course, we can argue on how clean nuclear actually is, but when it comes to carbon uh, emissions, it might be one of the better solutions. Um, I think the key term back here is competitiveness. That um, what we have seen recently is that Central European countries had a competitive advantage about physical proximity, lower wage standards, lower regulation of work, to be very honest. Um, and digital transformation is a challenge here because uh, many of the jobs will be globalized if, if we want to be um, very honest and frank about that because 
you know, remote work also means that your job could be done by somebody else from the other end of the world. And, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we were talking about this when we uh, consider terms like outsourcing and so on and so forth. But the pandemic has shown that most of the jobs, most of the office jobs could actually be done from wherever you are, if you have a reliable internet connection. So keeping competitiveness here will be a question which is very complicated and it might be more difficult than just regulation on the national level, on the European level, maybe on the global level. But I think the Hungarian government also realized that it has to embrace these kind of changes in order to address the needs of society. Of course, uh, it remains to be seen that how this will look in reality, but the willingness is, is, is there. And if we look at uh, what are the main trends for the 2020s when it comes to the circular economy, when it comes to green energy, they're not so out of the mainstream, if I may mm. put it that way. Katerina, uh, do we have any questions? Yes, and let's stay for a little bit with V4. Uh, there is a question about how can, and if at all, uh, the V4 countries can influence the uh, European Union policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia, China, or the EU. Are our views uh, of the Visegrad Cor four countries even taken into consideration? And is it possible to develop at all a joint V4 approach to this issue? I'm gonna let Tomas take that uh, since he is the, the, the top diplomat among us <laughs> from the V4, so go ahead. Uh, I would say that uh, V4 can uh, influence the uh, EU agenda uh, on Russia, on China, on the US, on other issues. Uh, we can do it when uh, constructively engaging uh, with other partners uh, in, the, uh, in the Union. Uh, for example, we have regular dialogue with uh, Germany as a V4 countries on Russia, which I, I mean is very important on Eastern partnership. Uh, because uh, we need to discuss uh, on a working level, on a political level, uh, about uh, how we see the problems, what are our priorities, uh, whether we can uh, support each other. So uh, I believe we can do, we can do uh, quite a lot. And uh, frankly, I think it is much more done without uh, any media coverage, uh, which is to some extent pity because uh, then uh, the overlay not very positive image of the V4 in the European Union, especially among uh, some uh, Western uh, European uh, countries, uh, might be a little bit different because uh, the real life uh, practical engagement is quite often producing uh, quite wise uh, outcomes, quite a, a smart outcomes, uh, uh, not probably uh, the headlines of the newspaper in Europe, but uh, uh, at the end, uh, we have a lot of projects uh, where, for example, we work with uh, uh, other countries in uh, Central Europe, uh, uh, where we have Germany on board very often, uh, and that's, uh, that's uh, something uh, where we can uh, replicate uh, even farther. I think there is another audience question that Katarina would like to share. Yes, we have a question of Russia, uh, Russia and China resonating with us uh, quite a bit as well. And uh, I'll take us back to China. And the question is regarding One Belt, One Road initiative. What are the implications for the EU? Sergey, do you want to take that? It's a very general question, I would say. I mean, the implications can go from um, uh, kind of geostrategic issues, but also uh, towards even, you know, I was on the panel with uh, the foreign minister of um, Albania and of Montenegro just a week ago uh, in Turkey. And um, even when we're talking there about accession uh, issues in, in Montenegro, for example, there is an investment which is quite um, extensive uh, by by the Chinese into highway uh, investment highway so-called um, which raises you know where where everyone watching raise eyebrows uh, regarding increasing and unnecessary maybe dependencies uh, on 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 China and yet this is part of this um, of, of, of the strategy that the Chinese government is driving so I it's a it's a very you know, it's a it's a very general question to to kind of point at, at a certain uh, at a certain aspect, but maybe maybe other colleagues have something to add. 
Marton or Caroline, do you want to add anything to that? I'd love to jump in on that. Two things. Please do. Uh, <laughs> Belt and Road is mostly tailored for developing countries, and the EU member states are not developing countries. So uh, the edge of uh, China here is a little bit lesser. The other part is that you know within the EU, you have EU public procurement regulations, and those are very hard uh, obstacles to clear. Um, it wasn't mentioned yet, but I think someone sooner or later would have mentioned anyway that there's the other Hungary-China project, the Belgrade Budapest Rail Line. And it's really interesting to see that the Serbian section is going ahead with Russian-German Chinese cooperation, by the way, Siemens uh, supplying the signals equipment. Nothing has happened on the Hungarian side. And you know what's the reason for that? The reason for that is that all the procurement processes has to go through the EU public procurement system which takes a long time, which is a lots of institutional safeguards, which uh, uh, has certain transparency requirements. So I think those kind of deals that China was able to make in uh, the developing world in Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka, the Maldives, are a bit harder to do in EU member states because of this institutional safety net, if you wish. Caroline, any, any thoughts you'd like to add to the questions that were asked from the audience? Uh, just on the... BRI, we, you know, there was a lot of hype around it when it first came out. First, there was a lot of excitement about potential for business cooperation and all the industry associations were cl climbing all over each other to get papers out. And then there was a lot of worry about what that means for, for market and market access for other, for other countries. And now in the last couple of years, I just feel like there isn't as much interest, less worry and, uh, and uh, at least in the, in the European, uh, on the European side of it. I know from our side that we are in, in discussion with sort of a subset of those programs around opportunities in digital, but I, I don't know if it's, it's really been the big bang uh, that the Chinese hope for uh, internationally. So we're getting close to the end of our uh, event here, and I want to ask a closing question of all four of you. Caroline, I'm actually going to start with you here again, and it's a look forward, and basically we know that there are a lot of differences of opinion. We've heard of some of them today, um, different policies, that sort of thing. So how can these differences, uh, whether it's behavioral, whether it's policy, uh, pick, your, pick your platform, if you will, how can they be overcome to the mutual benefit of the V4 and Germany and to the EU as a whole? And as I said, Caroline, I'll start with you and then we'll go through the list of the panelists again. I, I can't really, I'm not the expert for the V4, so I leave that to the other panelists here, obviously. Um, and from the business perspective, it really does depend on a revitalization of these institutions that we've all spoken to it. Each of the panelists has commented on, on, on the weakness of, of the current multilateral institutions. And that's for business a necessity that these, uh, that there is agreement um, on uh, the rules that business needs to see in order to be able to promote growth. And, you know, for since the Second World War, we've been following a, a fairly open capitalist economic perspective. Everyone was welcoming the increasing interdependence of those economies. And, and now uh, we have a situation where, where there is an enormous interdependence. And if we uh, wanted to try to turn that back, uh, I'm not sure uh, all those nations who are uh, now seeking uh, increasingly protectionist um, uh, market development would, would be doing their citizens a favor. So we have to find a solution within the system where we, where we now currently in. We have those institutions of the organizations. Uh, Sergei Martin mentioned it all, they all mentioned them. Uh, we've got to try to revitalize the WTO. We have to work with those regimes uh, that we built up so carefully and with uh, so much work that include also discussion with the Chinese partners um, and it's to their advantage as well that, it, that it, they cannot promote their economic uh, model without, uh, without that agreement uh, between, at that level at least, in terms of the level playing field. So I, I think we have no other alternative, at least for the time being, than to try to resurrect and to re-strengthen those institutions. Tomas, what do you think about how the differences of positions can be overcome to the mutual benefit of the V4 Germany and to the EU as a whole? Uh, it's a 
about dialogue at the end of the day. Uh, it is about uh, people speaking to each other and trying to understand uh, the other's positions. Uh, if I can quote uh, Joe Biden, what uh, he promised uh, during his uh, inaugural speech is that uh, he will put himself into the shoes of uh, the other side Americans uh, to overcome uh, the misunderstandings or uh, lack of understanding in American society. And I believe we need to do it uh, a lot more <clears throat> in Europe and uh, have a more frank uh, dialogue uh, among ourselves and be also ready to uh, name, call the things uh, uh, as they are and not to uh, pretend that uh, we are doing something else. Because I, I believe there are a lot of uh, unexpressed uh, uh, grievances, uh, unexpressed uh, expectation that hasn't been met. Uh, and uh, this is producing uh, a lot of distrust uh, uh, within the pro within the club. Because uh, we need to uh, rebuild a, a union based on, uh, based on understanding of individual, individual uh, perspectives uh, and uh, on uh, awareness about the future, uh, future challenges for all of us. And I believe that, for example, climate change, as Martin uh, said, it is becoming an issue where I believe we can converge uh, on because it is about our future and future of our, uh, our kids uh, and uh, grandsons and granddaughters. So uh, I believe that this might be an opportunity and uh, we should uh, use it wisely and not to uh, create another uh, gaps or cleavages uh, within the European Union, within the Union. Marton, what say you? Um, how do you think those differences in positions can be best overcome to everyone's benefit? Well, certainly not by imposing the majority position on the others. Uh, there's a question in the QIA, QIA session that I would like to reflect to about uh, QMB in foreign policy. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a QMB vote in uh, uh, the case of the EU-Russia summit, it would have easily flied because there would have been a majority of countries according to the QMB who wanted to convene this meeting. It was shut down at the end because uh, there was a requirement for unanimity. But I think if uh, you open this box, you might get unexpected results from time to time with uh, the main partners, if you wish, like Russia and China, because the positions of different EU member states might be very different than from the, than from the perceived positions of, of EU member states. That's one thing. The other is that um, I think um, Tomasz was absolutely right in saying that we have to understand the other side. And the EU is, is still in the making. Um, it is still an unfinished business. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised that we have these differences amongst each other. Now, whether you want to overcome these differences by force uh, or whether you would like to overcome these differences by negotiation will make a big difference if I look at the future of the EU. If we can go either way, um, I'm, I'm fully aware of that, but uh, maybe doing it by force might not lead to results that everybody can wholeheartedly support. And that would be a problem in the long run, apart from all the problems like climate change and so on that we have at the moment. Sergey, what do you think? We'll have you bring it home as it were with uh, your thoughts about how we can change or what differences in positions we can, we can take in order to overcome uh, the problems or the differences that we have and have that mutual benefit uh, for the V4 and Germany and the EU. Um, maybe, uh, first of all, uh, reacting to what Kirk Caroline said, um, um, I, I, it, it's not gonna work that we will just try to um, um, uh, kind of say, you know, uh, cooperation is important and interdependence is important full stop. I think all we, we need to start thinking strategically there as well. First of all, I think it is important to reduce uh, interdependencies in strategically sensitive issues uh, uh, and, and fields. Um, uh, so there we, we, we would need less interdependencies. Um, and by that, I mean the energy sector, but also uh, 5G technologies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, interdependency as, as um, uh, interdependence as, as a, a goal in itself is a, and in itself 
is not what we need. We need uh, interdependence with, uh, you know, which is sensible. Uh, number, number two, yes, a cooperation, but cooperation with red lines and without naivety. Uh, and as you mentioned yourself, uh, uh, Caroline, I'm sorry that I'm addressing you, but you, <laughs> because you brought this, uh, uh, we are uh, too often too naive uh, regarding the uh, geostrategic um, um, purposes and geostrategic motives of, of the other side. Um, we can, can cooperate on health issues, we can cooperate on climate issues, but let's not fool ourselves by, uh, you know, uh, offering vaccines to Hungary, uh, Russia is not doing just charity, uh, uh, just as China does. not uh, This is a geopolitical game they're playing, and we should not be naive uh, and uh, kind of price in um, the, this, this component on any agreements uh, uh, from that side. And uh, red lines uh, in cooperation, I don't need to, you know, I always reiterate this kind of the three points that I have, not at the expense of human rights, not at the expense of solidarity within the European Union and with neighbors, and not uh, uh, into the pockets of, of uh, uh, corrupt oligarchs. So these would be the three red lines that with a kind of a due diligence of any transaction with, with the adversaries before that and the expectation management so that they know these are our red lines. Um, so, and now to, to the internal uh, European points. Qualified majority vote, this is the QMMB, what Martin said, maybe for those who don't, don't know the, uh, the abbreviation. I agree with, and I understand your concerns that by uh, introducing majority votes, so moving away from unanimity that we have now in foreign relations, we would probably have problems with you know, dissenting vo votes and the larger countries would be able to create majorities that kind of override maybe also Central and Eastern European countries and Baltic states with whom I'm on the same page on many issues. But on the other hand, let's look at what is happening now and or, or what is not happening now. We are not taken seriously anymore increasingly not taken seriously anymore because we are not able to act because we always have the lowest denominator in, in all those issues. And yes, probably this would mean that would have meant last week that uh, Macron and Merkel probably would have prevailed with their uh, uh, vision of, you know, let's copy Biden. And I would disagree with that, but at least we would have a decision um, and next time we will have to create other majorities and get other people on on, on, on board. But at least we would be uh, an, an, an entity that is able to act uh, instead of the entity that doesn't is not able to act on the international uh, realm. And the final point, um, we will only be able to project power, soft power, hard power, you name it, uh, uh, globally, if we have credibility uh, uh, and coherence inside ourselves. And yes, EU is an un unfinished business, but destroying EU, EU values from inside by siding with outside forces and basically producing an alternative ideology to the EU itself from the EU with the illiberal democracy proposal that is being copied now by the bodies in Slovenia and, and many other countries is exactly the wrong way of you know, unfinishing this unfinished business. We need to get back to the basics that we have. And this is about values and this is about liberal democracy values. This is what the European Union was built on. And the more we have fights like we had and we're having now with, with, with Hungary at this point, supported by Poland and Slovenia only, the less we will be taken seriously by outside, by, by the outside. So we do have a lot of work to do, but this is not going to be just kind of a, you know, a decades of a search, you know, soul searching because we are unfinished. Well, let's finish. Let's finish it in a way where we are, we can be proud of ourselves and project the power that also the, the ideological or the soft power that we deserved as a union. Does anybody want to respond to, to Sergey? We have 60 seconds. Um, so if anybody feels passionate, because he's very passionate, and I see Mar Marton raising his hand, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, just very quickly, and uh, not to pick up on all the 60 points, seconds. But yeah. yeah, I think that you know these are the kind of debates that we must have before we can actually have a decision and move in a certain direction. So I wouldn't be afraid of these engagements. Uh, there are many signs of this coin. 
And therefore, I think uh, it's vital to have these conversations sooner rather than later, because I might not agree with Sergey on many of the points. And I think, I think ideologically, we're words apart, but we're in the same club and we are shaping the rules of the same club. So if we're not going to talk about this, nobody will. And then something that uh, Sergey mentioned about unfinishing the unfinished European Union might actually happen. But to avoid that, we have to take ourselves more, uh, and the other more seriously, and we have to keep these conversations going. Tomas raised his hand briefly. Did you want to say something? Uh, Literally 30 seconds. Go ahead, because we got a, We have a, a, a tight deadline here. Of turning very, off. very briefly, uh, I wouldn't uh, like to be in the shoes of Martin today. Uh, however, uh, I would uh, only uh, point out that uh, while uh, mentioning dialogue, it is not only about dialogue uh, among countries. It is also within our societies, within Germany, within Czech Republic, within Hungary, because uh, we uh, see very similar uh, trends as we see in the United States, that the societies are too polarized. And there is also a problem of our lack of uh, um, actionness or externness. As long as you will have uh, over polarized uh, European society, your ability to agree on something wouldn't rely on a majoritarian voting or not, would rely on public support. And uh, we need to work on that. Well, a really powerful way to end this joint event by the Aspen Institute Central Europe and the Aspen Institute Germany. I'd like to thank all of our esteemed panelists for a very impactful discussion and the audience for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.